Rabbi, it's good to be with you again. Uh, today we have a topic that I suppose is not a joy, certainly um, not in its substance, but it's something that we have to take very seriously because, as you know better than I, uh, there are many people who might have very little connection to the Jewish community, but when it comes to the time of their loss, to funerals and mourning, they want to be connected to the Jewish community, and they call upon your services in particular. So the texts I've chosen are texts that I believe you'll be able to draw upon in your teaching, in your speaking, but more importantly than anything else, they're texts that I feel will help you question yourself. Uh, what is it that we believe? What is it that we do? Uh, and what's the relationship between what we believe and what we do? I'm going to address these texts with you uh, in what I guess we would call a chronological order. In this case, the order of death, burial, mourning. Uh, we're not going to cover everything by any means. Very specific texts I've chosen, as you know. Uh, it might surprise you to learn that when I think of this in chronological order, I want to begin with the text from the Yerushalmi, uh, which speaks about mourning. Now, mourning obviously does not come before the funeral, it comes after the funeral, but this text makes a very important contribution and is in its way the most provocative of all of these texts. And for that reason, I think that it takes priority here. Uh, it begins, as you know, with the question, how do we know from the Torah, minayin la'evel mina Torah, uh, shiva, how do we know that avelut, that mourning, the prime, prime or primary uh, period of mourning for seven days comes from the Torah. Uh, the first answer, which is provided, is a very straightforward one. It, it comes from the report of Joseph's mourning for his father, Ve'asla Aviv Avel Shivat Yamim. He made a mourning for seven days. It would seem to be a perfectly good source. But the Rishami challenges this and says, can we learn something from the law of Torah um, or for the law of Torah, from the period before the Torah was actually given? Uh, the answer uh, for these purposes is no. And so the Yerushalmi here in the name of a particular rabbi, Rabbi Yaakov Bar Acha, B'Shem Rabbi Ze'era, suggests a source from the Torah which comes after the giving of the Torah, that is to say after Exodus chapter 20. And uh, it's really a, a wonderful and, in my mind, very interesting uh, suggestion. It's speaking about the period of the Miluim, the period during which Aaron and his sons uh, were being installed in their offices to serve in the priesthood. And the description of the Torah there is, Seven days observing the observance for the Mishkan, for the tabernacle, all of this in preparation for their performance of their duties now being installed into this office. And the question, of course, is what in the world does this have to do with mourning? Why is this a source relevant here? The Gemara continues and says, Kashem sheshimer Kadosh Baruch Hu al olamo shiva kach atem shamru al achechem shiva. Uh, we mix in here another story. The claim is, just as God observed for seven for his world, so too should you observe for seven for your brothers. Uh, what is this reference in creation to the world? The Gemara goes on. How do we know that God uh, guarded, observed, you can translate the term as you like, for present purposes, I'll leave it relatively untranslated. How do you know that God did this for seven days? Because it says, now back in Breshit, Vayihi l'shivat hayamim umei hamabul hayu al ha'aretz. Um, and when seven days had passed, the water of the floods came upon the earth. What's the connection? First of all, back to my earlier question, what's the connection of the installation of the priests to observing Shiva? Now, if you opened up the text and looked at the next chapter, you will have observed that the installation of the priests comes immediately before the story we all know so well of the strange fire offered by Aaron's sons, Nadav and Abihu, 
uh, and their uh, elimination, uh, their, um, the end of their lives brought about by God um, for their offering of the strange fire. The suggestion being made here is that the seven days which they spent in the tent, they weren't permitted to go out of the tent, presumably in anticipation of fulfilling their office, was actually a shiva, it was a mourning period, but the mourning period came before the death of their sons slash brothers, just as God mourned the loss of life in the world before the flood was brought. In other words, the image here, both of humans mourning and of God mourning, is of mourning that comes in advance of death. Uh, the Gemara obviously knows what it's doing and asks this question, umitablim kodem sheyamut hamet, and do we mourn before the person dies? Uh, very interesting answer. Ela basar vadam sheino yodea mati liot, human beings, flesh and blood, who don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future. Eino mitabel ad sheyamut hamet, flesh and blood doesn't mourn until um, someone dies. But God, who of course knew when the flood would come and knew therefore when life would be lost, mourns in advance. Uh, more crucially, it is God who directed Aaron and the other sons to mourn for the sons of Aaron who would die. And the ideal offered here, therefore, is not a mourning that follows death, but a mourning that precedes death. Uh, those of us who uh, have experienced this in our own lives, or if you've been close to others who have experienced such loss, know that in some ways as important or even more important uh, than the mourning that comes after death is the anticipation of death and the real mourning that comes with the anticipation of death. The need to face that, not to deny it, to recognize that someone is dying. This was, of course, a tradition that went back to the Bible and then continued for many, many centuries. Uh, we in the present day uh, are least good at recognizing the importance of this. We need a moment, uh, actually a shiva, uh, to begin mourning, to begin separating. Uh, this constitutes the first significant emotional step in the process which we're considering here. That's why I address it first. Now, um, following mourning, at least in the ideal way that uh, the Yerushalmi just described, comes death. Uh, and death has its meanings, and the rituals we observe uh, around death are rituals that emerge from the beliefs, from the meanings that underlie them. It's for this reason that I assigned you the texts from Shabbat. The mission already makes it clear that we're in a different world than the one we're accustomed to, at least if we understand it uh, at its word, if we take it seriously. The Mishnah near the bottom of Kufnan Olive Ahmed Olive says, Osim kol tzorchei hamet. We perform on Shabbat all of the needs, tzorchei hamet. This is different than the word used slightly earlier in the Mishnah, above on the page, iskei hamet, the business of the mates. Tzorch has a very specific meaning. Uh, the models or the examples of what constitutes Sorche here include the anointing and the washing uh, and the laying out of the body. Uh, I want to argue, and we'll see, I, I think that this is the best interpretation, um, that these are needs of the deceased because, quite frankly, um, the deceased is understood still to be aware, to be sentient in body, to feel, uh, and to be aware in mind or in soul, and therefore what we do for the deceased, the deceased will experience, will feel, and that affects everything that's happening here. Uh, the Gemara which makes this clearest is the one at the bottom of the next page, Kuf Nun Bet Ahmed Olive, uh, and for me it's a very important text because of what it teaches us not only about the belief system of our ancestors, the one we inherit, but about our own belief system as well. Uh, I say this because it is a text which, as far as I've been able to find, has always been mistranslated by modern translators, including, remarkably, translators who translate the Hebrew into Hebrew. That is to say, the Gemara's Hebrew into modern Hebrew. Um, let me be uh, uh, somewhat more specific. Amar Rabbi Yitzchak is the third line from the bottom. Kasheri ma lamed kemachat bibsar 
um, the worm which comes to the flesh of the deceased after death is as painful to the deceased, says Rabbi Yitzchak, as a needle in the flesh of the living. Um, he quotes here from Job uh, to prove this, and uh, you can look at the source. It's actually not a bad source if understood relatively literally. Um, and then listen to where it goes. Um, that's the flesh. What about the soul? Based upon the same Jobian source, uh, a person's soul mourns for him for seven days. In other words, the Shiva is a Shiva observed not just by the mourners, as we understand them, but uh, the Shiva is a mourning period observed by the deceased as well for the very simple reason. Um, I could be a little bit glib about it and say because it's a bummer to die, um, but with all of the glibness, it actually communicates exactly what's intended here. Better be living than dead, to be sure. Um, and so the person who has died um, will be upset and need to mourn, need to be comforted, in fact, for his or her own death. Uh, and that's exactly what the Gemara goes on to illustrate. Amar um, Yehuda, Meit she'en lo menachamin, hochin asara adam v'yoshvim bim komo. Um, the first part of this teaching, Rav Yehuda says, a dead person, a deceased, who does not have menachamim. Uh, go look at your translations. You will find uh, usually a translation like mourner, right? A, so a deceased who has no mourners. Uh, ten people should gather and sit in his place. That is to say the place of the deceased. Um, and that apparently will perform whatever it performs. This, of course, is a custom which, uh, in most settings, has um, long since been forgotten, although there are some communities where this is still observed. Uh, what's most important for me is the mistranslation. As you all know, if you take the term seriously, minachamin, minachem means not mourners, uh, but quite clearly comforters. Now, it refers to the same people we call mourners, but it says that the people who mourn are not merely, meaning their job is not merely to mourn themselves and receive comfort, but one of their tasks, one of their essential tasks, is to offer comfort to the deceased, who of course will still be in relationship with them and will still know what they are doing. And so if there are no survivors, no loved ones, in other words, to offer uh, comfort, then it's essential for the community to perform that task. That's what Rabbi Huda teaches. And the story which follows makes this absolutely clear. <laughs> so a certain uh, individual died in the neighborhood of Rabbi Huda. <laughs> and there were no comforters there, no survivors who could provide comfort. So what happened? Kol Yom Devar Rav Yehuda Be'asara, each day Rav Yehuda would gather ten, a minion, ve'yatve beduchte, and they would sit in his place. Lachar shiva yamin itchaze le'bechilme de Rav Yehuda. After the seven days were over, after the morning period was over, the deceased appeared to Rav Yehuda in his dream, ve'amarle, and said to him, Tanuach da'atach she'inachta et da'ati. Your mind should be at rest, for you have put me at rest. You have comforted me. Uh, there's no doubt what the original teaching means because of the way it's illustrated by the story. This is uh, a culture which, like all of the cultures that surrounded it, believed that the deceased knew what happened in the deceased's presence. And since it was hard to leave this life and go on to the next stage we call death, um, required comfort. If you look at the top of the next page, there's, uh, well, actually, the bottom of the same page before we get to the next story, um, a wanderful teaching. Kol yod bed chodesh, gufo kayam v'nishmato, ola v'yoredet. Lachar yod bed chodesh, haguf batel v'nishmato, ola v'shuv ena yoredet. Um, body lasts uh, in, you know, some measure or another for roughly 12 months, at the end of which the body is gone. The soul during that 12 months goes up and down, but after the 12 months is gone, um, will go up and not come down again. Note the way the experience of the deceased mirrors the experience of the mourners, or I should say vice versa, the way the experience of the mourners mirrors the experience of the deceased. There's a shiva, um, there is a year period, and the person who survives experiences in parallel um, what the person who's deceased 
experiences. Uh, we then go on with a teaching which once again says that the hespet, uh, the talk at the funeral, will make it clear whether the person who is being eulogized has a place in the world to come. Uh, the story is a story in which the person who is deceased, uh, rabbi in this case, um, rabba, um, comes back after his death and indicates that the nature of the hesped is important, was important, because it reflects upon his place in the world to come. These are just several of many, many sources which come to the same point. Um, the belief is in the survival of the deceased in the next stage of life called death. Uh, this has uh, many, many consequences in halacha uh, that I think we've forgotten uh, to be uh, aware of. We've forgotten them because our belief system has changed. First of all, when we say kvod hamet, the many things we do for kvod hamet, the honor of the dead, I'm not sure what we mean by that, um, but based upon the Gemara sources, it's clear that kvod means like it would mean to us. Um, that is to say, if someone in your presence honors you, it matters because you know it. If someone in your presence dishonors you, it matters because you know it. Uh, it is based upon this foundation, that a text I didn't ask you to prepare, but I suspect that many of you know quite well, the beginning of the third chapter of Brachot spells out its laws. It's Misha Meto Mutalifanav, someone who's deceased is in front of them, not yet buried, is exempt from a variety of mitzvot. Uh, the Gemara, quoting a Brayta, um, expands this law um, quite considerably, including in a way that uh, I want to comment on here, better if your deceased is still there. And of course, they assume death would happen ideally in the deceased's own home, and you would be there. Um, eat in another house while he's still there. Why? Because he knows you're eating in his presence, and he can't eat anymore. Right? And this would be disgracing or mocking the deceased, as the Gemara goes on later to say. Right? So if you don't have a second house, eat in your neighbor's house. If you don't have a neighbor's house, you can eat. Then at least make sure you're in a different room. If you can't do it in a different room, turn the other way. All of this is directed to the concern that doing things that the living can still do and the deceased can no longer do um, would be a mockery of the deceased, which is why in this context, uh, the Gemara quotes from Mishle, Loeg, Larash, Chayref, Osehu. This is a disgracing and insulting, if you will, a dissing. Um, of uh, the deceased. Now, um, I, I want to reference our experience in order to see how uh, the change in our belief system uh, has affected the way we practice these things. One example, and I'm sure you could add many, many more. Um, the custom here in the East, and I know it is elsewhere, but not all other places in this country, and certainly not around the world in Jewish communities, is that when uh, a funeral takes place at a funeral home, which of course it typically does, um, the family is put in a room on the side of the chapel, not in the chapel itself, and those who are coming to the funeral typically line up, uh, enter the room, and convey some brief words of uh, condolence to the family on their way into the chapel. Uh, when they've arrived in the chapel, they sit usually relatively quietly, but uh, speaking to their neighbors, awaiting the beginning of the service. Of course, all this time, the deceased is in uh, the casket, in, in the coffin, in the front of the chapel. Uh, from the traditional perspective, this is absolutely outrageous. Uh, first of all, because before the burial, before the funeral, the mourners are not yet mourners, and this is for good reason. I and mean, this text in Brachot is about this status in between death and before burial. As you know, the name of that status is Onain, Aninut. It is not fitting to, again, from a traditional perspective, address words of comfort to an Onain. First of all, because comfort is impossible. And secondly, because, and this is crucial, it involves dissing the deceased. Um, when people go in and sit there, and rather than reciting psalms, sit and speak with their neighbors, however respectfully and quietly, and it's not only, always that, um, they are ignoring the deceased, who in the traditional belief is in front of the room and knows everything happening in his or her presence, and knows, therefore, that he or she is being ignored. Now, I know our belief system has changed, 
But that raises two interesting questions. Number one, how does our change in belief system affect our rituals? Right? We need to ask the question of that relationship. That's something I leave to you, but I think it's something that's worth being aware of. Secondly, are we so sure that our belief system has changed so completely? Um, and that leads me to the final text and the um, final question I want to leave you with. You'll recall that in our last session, we began effectively on Ahmed Olive. Um, of uh, Ketubot, uh page 8, Chet. Um, there we saw the discussion of the rituals of marriage. We paid, spent some time uh, particularly on the Sheva Brachot, but we saw also how there were these parallel periods and rituals from weddings, which we now see uh, in the context of mourning funerals and the like. Um, I'm now on Chet Amud Bet. You all already knew Shiva, uh, Shloshim, uh, and the year. Um, we also saw from the Yerushalmi text, hinted in the Yerushalmi text, the importance of preparing for death, just as weddings, as we saw, are prepared for. There is, during the Shiva, at least as the, far as the Gemara is concerned, a, a ritual of reciting blessings uh, at a meal, and these blessings here, I don't want to take the time to go through them, but look at the four blessings, um, which are articulated here by Reish Lakish. The first, Keneged Shibcho Shel HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The second, Keneged Avelim, against the, corresponding to the mourners. The third, Keneged Menachamei Avelim, those who comfort the mourners. And the fourth, corresponding to, to all Israel. It's a wonderful ritual, I might add, that this um, leads to the teaching that uh, the Hachamim established that a mourner in the house of mourning should have ten glasses of wine at each meal. Uh, now, of course, they drank their wine diluted by half, uh, half so it's five cups. Nevertheless, um, they considered this important, important part of the ritual as well, to comfort, to help them get through. Um, but the parallel is outstanding. What's the meaning of this parallel? I already hinted at last time. I want to come back to right now. Um, being married is understood as being born into a new life. Dying, too is understood as being born into the next stage of life. It is not the end, as many of us consider it in our world. Uh, it's the beginning of something new. This is a crucial possibility, not a belief yet, but a possibility. Uh, we all know how, A, when people approach this time of their lives where they lose loved ones, what they thought they believed is thrown into tumult. Uh, they're open to possibilities that they thought before they might not be open to. When they face their own deaths, they ask questions that they never would have asked before. And when they have heard that Judaism is all concentrated on this life and that the next world is not part of Jewish belief or whatever version they've heard this in, and as a matter of emphasis, there's some truth to this, uh, but when they're looking for mystery, too often they have to look in other directions for this mystery. What we've got in these sources uh, is the mystery that too many of us have forgotten. Uh, the possibility that there is a next life, not just the world to come, but the world following what we call death, the extended life uh, that they call death, uh, with its consciousness and with its possibility of relationship, because the stories are multiple which have those who are in that world in relationship, very real relation to those in this world. Uh, I would suggest that many of those whom we teach, many of those whom we serve, need this mystery uh, at least as a possibility when they face some of life's most difficult moments. Uh, and so as you ask yourself about these belief systems and ask are they too foreign to even take advantage of, uh, what I would urge you to do is consider the possibility that even articulated as questions uh, of past Jewish belief. These are very, very important to resor resources to draw upon. How many of us want to believe, as much as we say it can't be, uh, that there's the possibility of relationship following the death of our loved ones? If we can share that, then we will have accomplished something very important. That's a mark.